first speaker is Dr. Fred Pryor from Arkansas, uh, giving a lecture on data curation and quantitative analysis, NCIS uh, Cancer Imaging Archive. Fred, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here on this lovely afternoon. I will try to keep it a little bit energetic so that uh, I keep you away from going outside where it's beautiful. Um, I think Professor Marty Bonmati and I should have been back to back. We are, but separated by the tea break, because we're actually giving, I think, two halves of the same talk, and you'll see what I mean by that in a second. Um, so I'm really going to focus on the data that we need for developing new algorithms and what it really means to do data curation, what the data quality aspects uh, that are required if we're going to move forward to actually make usable and useful tools. So um, we focused on a lot today about on supervised learning and I'm going to continue to focus on, on that approach because that's where we need the most labeled data. Um, we need labeled data in order to train the algorithms, but to validate them as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about how do we get labeled data, but first we're going to talk about how do we get the data that we used in order to generate labeled information and to train these uh, data sets. I'm sorry, to train the algorithms. So uh, my contention is for a machine learning algorithm to be clinically useful, it really has to be trained on data that appropriately represents the variance, variation in human biology, the variance in the presentation of the disease of interest, and the variance in the data uh, collection systems. Now we've heard this all mentioned already today, but that first one we never pay enough attention to. There are seven and a half going on eight billion people on this planet, and they're not the same. In order to look at the variance in that population, you need a lot of data. So in the US, we have two projects, the All of Us Project and the Million Veterans Program, both of which are collecting data on a million people. In the UK, you have the UK Biobank Program, which is similarly sized. Those are beginning to be the right size. And unfortunately, only the UK Biobank has imaging. We couldn't convince the Americans that imaging was worth the expense. So there are a number of limitations in, in terms of the data that we have available and uh, limit its, limits its availability for use in um, AI research and machine learning research, but also this limits its availability to the research community in general. I've already made this point about the variance in the human population. Well, when we collect data, and particularly the collections that I'm gonna talk about uh, that was funded by the US National Cancer Institute, we collect cancer patients' data, not normal, healthy humans. So it's really difficult to train algorithms to look at the variance in the population as a whole when all you have are examples of pathology. Now, there are some cases where there are very large normative data sets. For example, the Human Connectome Project in neuroscience collected 1,200 normal, healthy volunteers. There's a whole cadre of follow-on connectomics projects. So if you're lo looking at um, gliomas, glioblastomas, life is pretty good because there are very large, very well curated standard data sets that you can use for comparison. But for most uh, cancers, such data sets really don't exist. So that is a key limitation that I keep pointing out to the National Cancer Institute that we really need to be collecting the, the normals to compare. But there's another interesting problem uh, having to do with intellectual property. So we've talked a lot about algorithms that are being developed for clinical use. Those are medical devices. People sell them. And so in order to get those devices approved, they need to have data. Now, in many instances, the company and the institutions, academic institutions, consider data to be their intellectual property. They want to hold on to it. Um, when you, in fact, many researchers have that, that idea that they, want, they do not want to share their data, it's part of what they've generated as the intellectual contributions for the laboratory. Um, Dr. Kapathy Kramer mentioned challenge competitions. We participated in a number of those, but providing data, that's a nice way to 
develop algorithms in a, in a, a competitive, competitive environment where you might win a million dollars if your algorithm does better than everybody else's. But really, from my perspective, it generates labeled data that we can then capture and reuse for other purposes. But it also means that we sequester data during the competition, and in many cases, we sequester that data forever, which takes it out of the pool of useful research data. Now, the FDA has argued very strongly in the US that they must have sequestered data in order to validate uh, algorithms that are going to be used commercially. And there's a lovely publication that just came out, uh, I think last month, there's a reference to it, which describes the FDA's overall framework for dealing with um, software as a medical device, that's what that acronym means, that are you based on AI and machine learning. So the FDA has spent a lot of effort on, on dealing with this problem because they know it's this massive freight train that's coming right at them that has to be dealt with. They have to have a framework in which they can deal with the, the information. So I'm not gonna go through all that, although it, it is, um, it, it's a great document. I think they've done a good job. There are different classes of medical devices in the US and depending on what class your device is, it may need to actually go through the complete clinical trial or a 510K or, you know, or even a, a simpler process. But what I wanna focus on here is the amount of data that this process takes out of circulation. It's a sequestered data that of course is needed for model validation. The FDA wants to control a data set. They may reuse it to test multiple algorithms, but they wanna have a very large labeled data set that they're keeping. Of course, um, the vendor has gathered a set of data that they use for training and testing their algorithm. And this model actually takes into account this retraining approach where you put it into the, into the marketplace, but the algorithm continues to learn. So that's basically your data from your institution, but um, both the vendor and the VA want to control that data. So we're now talking about a very large amount of high quality data that would be very useful for research that's locked away and you'll never see it, we'll never be able to use it for research. So this is, this intellectual property problem is sort of normally invisible, but it, we deal with it all the time as we lose a lot of data to this process. So several people have also mentioned the truth problem. And I think this is a critical issue. We have no ground truth. I remember when I first I wrote my very first grant dealing with medical, quantitative medical imaging. And I said, well, okay, so, if, what does a radiologist use for truth? Well, what the pathologist said. Okay, so I looked at what the pathologist's problem and said, well, what does a pathologist use for truth? Pathologist is always right. Um, <laughs> this didn't sound to me like a good plan. We don't really have a good gold standard of truth. But what we do have is a number of ways of approximating that. And uh, one of the approaches that I think is most useful is this idea of taking multiple observers, they may be human or machine, and finding ways of weighting their contribution, in other words, an estimate of how accurate their information is, and then coming up with a voting algorithm that combines them. So there are two algorithms that are, one is very well known, uh, the staple algorithm that uh, Simon Warfield at Harvard came up with some years ago. We made a little contribution to this, an algorithm called Veritas. They do pretty much the same thing, only we have different standards. But the point is, we don't really have ground truth, but maybe we can model truth. And in order to validate algorithms, we need some consensus models for what truth is. Okay, so we heard a lot of people talking about data, and we need a lot of data. And I've already hinted that I think it's the, the scale of data based upon the variance in human population. But there's another way of looking at the amount of data. Um, Deep learning algorithms, and you've heard a lot about that today, um, have this really nice property that they don't necessarily need um, the input of, say, what a radiologist is looking for in the images, the engineered features. They can learn their own features, but they need a lot of data in order to do that. And so Ian Goodfellow, who um, works for Google, wrote a wonderful textbook on deep learning. And in it, he has this nice rule of thumb that I, that I use to, to guide my thinking on this. And he says, whoops, 
A supervised deep learning algorithm will generally achieve acceptable performance with around 5,000 labeled samples. And you saw several speakers today give, present data that sort of corresponds with this. Between five and 7,000 cases, you, you seem to get good results. But if you want to get over this issue of generalizability, if you really want to represent the biology accurately, it's more like 10 million. Well, if you Google, that's easy, right? I mean, you know, if you're trying to figure out what, how, what I'm likely to buy next week when I get on the internet, there's tons of information about me, in fact, about all of us. So for them, 10 million label data sets is a small data set. But for us, that's a whole lot of data. And how do we get that amount of data, make it available, and more importantly, how do we label it? So that's really what I'm gonna deal with. And um, since 2010, my group has, and I have been dealing with this problem of how do we accumulate information and make it publicly available? Uh, in 2010, the National Cancer Institute in the US put out a request for applications to build a, an information resource, a cancer imaging resource, and to maintain it. And for better or for worse, we won that and have maintained it ever since. Um, it's called the Cancer Imaging Archive uh, for an interesting historic region, uh, reason. The Cancer Genome Atlas was being built at the time. TCGA sort of made sense. TCIA doesn't make sense, but at least it was better than CIA, which is the other answer. Uh, so um, this is information repository that's built in what's called the FAIR principle, which is the data has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. Uh, we work really hard on the first three. The fourth one is sort of up to the people who give us the data, but we do our best to make sure that the, it's at least um, properly discoverable and that you can cross-link it. And so that's really what we, we spend our time doing is acquiring data, both imaging data, radiology and pathology predominantly, although we have a growing number of uh, small animal imaging data sets, PDX models, et cetera. Um, but also information about the human subjects who gave us the data or the animal subjects, uh, clinical information, outcomes data, and a growing amount of genes, uh, genomic profiles or uh, patho path uh, bah, uh, proteomics data, too much pathology in the mind. So it's a very large repository of a wide variety of different types of information. And the key thing that we spend our time doing is curation. And that's really what I want to talk about is how do you make data useful? How do you make it findable and interoperable, et cetera? So this is just the sort of the eye candy slide of the kind of information that we, that I've already mentioned, pathology, radiation therapy data, huge amount of that, and then all types of cancer imaging information. It's an information repository that you can search online. Uh, about 15,000 people a month do that. They download on average about 75 terabytes of data a month. Um, last time I did the rolling 12 month average, which was, uh, a couple weeks ago, it was 950 terabytes of data every 12 months that are downloaded by researchers from 125 countries around the world. So it's a well-used uh, repository. You've heard several speakers today who use data from TCIA. We keep track of the publications that have used the data, uh, retrospective research using this information. Now, one of the things that to me is key for having high quality data, and I'm gonna talk about data quality in a minute, is that we need to ensure that the information that we get has cons been consistently collected with consistent protocols. Um, I did an experiment when I was at Washington University where we had collected data supposedly with a standard brain protocol for looking at GBMs, and the short answer was out of 300 cases, I could find 11 that actually consistently could adhere to that imaging protocol. Now maybe it's better in the UK and other places, but in the US, clinical information does not, is not gathered in, according to consistent protocols. You can define the protocols, but the data is not collected that way unless it's a research trial. And so we spend a lot of our effort focused on collecting data from high quality clinical trials where someone has spent the time to look at um, and enforce rules about 
the acquisition protocols, and they've done quality assurance on the images, at least to, to some level. So that's the first stage, if you will, of assuring high quality. Now, of course, it's already been pointed out that there are a limited number of such trials, but as you can see from this number, this is, these are the groups that we're currently working with in the US, and in the next three years, we're looking at basically multiplying our data volume by about a factor of five. Now, a lot of that is pathology. They grow very, very quickly because pathology images are quite large. So this is how one of the approach, the key approaches that we're using to gather a large amount of data, having that data be of reasonable quality so that we can then through our curation process, make it cross-linkable so that we can take data from multiple lung cancer trials and link it together into um, meta-analysis sets that we believe can be used for, for machine learning algorithm development and validation. So what do I mean by data quality? A good friend and colleague of mine, John Talbert, actually runs a, uh, an entire academic program on information quality and data quality. I'm not going to bore you with the difference between the two because I tend to focus more on the data quality, but he has these four pillars. Data quality is based upon data governance. Now, a bit redundant here, data quality, but for me, that really should read data curation, uh, which also covers data integration. How do I make sure that the data is uh, cross-linkable and that all of its internal linkages are, are correct? And then finally, analytics. So for the Cancer Imaging Archive, we have a rather complicated data governance process that starts with if you want to give us a data set, you fill out an online form and it goes to the National Cancer Institute where a committee decides whether or not they're sufficiently interested in your data set to warrant its collection. That tends to filter out a lot of data which I would like to keep, collect, but it is the process that the government, our government has given us. But it does one very important thing for data quality. The National Cancer Institute makes sure that all of the data was collected with proper consent so that the, the, the human subjects consented for the reuse of their data in anonymized form. And that the data was collected according to the appropriate um, rules governing the use of humans in research, depending upon the country in which it's gathered. We gather data from all over the world. So that's their job, and I'm very happy that they do it. We have an, an, an institutional review, uh, review board protocol that governs what we do with the data to ensure that our institution is protected. But that combination is our way of making sure that we have dealt with the human subjects research questions accurately and adequately. And then we have a large, actually I think five now, different ways in which you can upload data to us depending upon the kind of data and where you are. And all that data goes into a curation process, which I said, which I said before is to us the key. We collect data so that it's de-identified before it leaves your site mostly de-identified. There's always hidden stuff, so it's part of the thing that we do once we get it. But we have a set of tools which we've developed over the years called Positive. They're now released open source uh, in a Docker container if you'd like to have them. These tools ensure that we've removed all protected health information, that all DICOM data structures are properly integrated uh, correctly, and a number of other things having to do with data quality and um, and in interoperability. So that's a set of tools that we use that implements this rather large pipeline of analysis steps to make sure that we have high quality data, which we then store and make, av make available. So the data is, in, is not visible until it's gone through this, even though it's been transferred to our site. We maintain it in a, on a private cloud. Uh, our private cloud, because we also manage a repository for the um, Centers for Disease Control. We are attacked on a regular basis by US Homeland Security to make sure that all of our security protocols are in place. That's not necessarily a good thing from our point of view, but it does mean that we maintain proper security. Um, so that's, those are the first three pillars. The fourth pillar of data analytics is something that we're still working on. This is again some eye candy that, that makes the unfortunate point that most of our analytics focus on usage. You know, because that's what the government is interested in, there are people using this. But really the analytics that are of value have to do with what we do automatically. So all of the data that we collect, we, put, we calculate a checksum and we, we check that 
in the background on a regular basis. So there was a question earlier about uh, the, an Israeli prank of automatic or um, embedding some um, uh, interesting images in a public collection. We would catch that through this process and would correct the information. Now we've never had we've never had that experience yet. That wasn't our data, but we have already built in the ability to ch to detect that. There was also another case where there's uh, the DICOM standard, which we rely on heavily, um, has in it what's called dual personality capability. And I won't bore you with what that means, but somebody figured out that you could put executable code in there, so turn a DICOM image into a Trojan horse. We also, within our positive toolkit, catch that and correct for it. There's a publication that some of my people, uh, it just went out yesterday, I think, how to deal with that problem. So those are the kind of quality metrics that we think are important. We don't report them, but we generate them in quality processes. Now, we still don't have enough data. And this is a, uh, these are the top 10 in terms of the number of human subjects participating, data sets that we have by, by cancer type. And you see lung cancer is by far the largest because we have the data from the US National Lung Screening Trial, which is 27,000 subjects. And you'll notice that this is the number of machine learning based publications or radiomics publications. So it correlates. And in fact, we have a pretty decent correlation. The more data, the more publications, except for brain. Um, there's been a whole lot of work in GBMs, I think largely because th of the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a lot of work is cross-linking the genomics with uh, imaging features, but also because there's availability of, of normal data sets. Now, capturing labeled data is, this, is the real problem here. The, so far I've talked about capturing data, but now somebody has to label it, and how do we do that? Um, you can do the math yourself if, if, if it takes, let's say, um, 20 minutes to go through a lung case and find all the nodules or, or a brain looking for all the met metastatic disease and, and segmenting all those features. If it takes a radiologist about 20 minutes to do that, so they can do three an hour, uh, and I want 10,000 labeled data sets, that's 10,000 hour, 10, hours, you know what a radiologist makes, so you can guess this is not a cheap process, but I really wanted 10 million. Um, that's a very not cheap process. So there are some alternatives for actually having those expert labels, even though those are the best labels. Uh, we've already heard about uh, Dr. Karpathy Kramer mentioned crowdsourcing. Um, that is a really important area that I think, as long as you're doing it with, for example, her crowd cured cancer uh, approach. Data augmentation and synthetic data, these are ways of actually generating more training data that already, we already have a label for one, you know, for a, for a given data set. Now I can morph that data set so that, for example, it looks like it was generated on a Siemens machine when it was actually generated on a GE machine because I have a, I don't, but folks at Harvard have models of those different machines, and so they can they can generate a data set as if it was had been generated on the other vendor's machine. That kind of data augmentation, I think, is very important to expand our labeled data cheaply. Uh, J uh, Jayshree's already talked about this. I think this is a very important approach to labeling data because you get hundreds of people, most of them radiologists, labeling the same information. So now I get statistics. I don't have to worry about do the three or nine radiologists agree or disagree. I have a hundred radiologists. I have a statistical distribution. That's much more satisfying to me for me to work with. But what really is labeled data? This is something that we've been struggling with because we want to manage, curate and manage labeled data. So what is it? Um, you can start with outcomes. Uh, I purposely picked pathologies because there's a room full of radiology people, so I'm going to force you to look at pathology slides. But it's the same problem, right? I, ha I can start with outcomes. So if I'm doing a, a deep learning algorithm, maybe all I care about is which subjects have cancer and which, which don't, or which have glioblastomas and which have gliomas, low-grade gliomas. So outcomes data might be enough. But most of us are worrying about segmentation. I have to identify objects in the image and segment them. Well, if you're talking about lung nodules, you might have a dozen. That's a path slide. There are a million cellular nuclei on there. Uh, human beings will not 
segment a million cellular nuclei. <laughs> it does, you know, full stop. So that has to be done by an algorithm. But is that really what I want? Or do I actually want the features that are derived from that, the mathematical representations of the characteristics of those objects? Or do I want clusters of that information? Because that's really what's, what's more interesting for the algorithm that I'm developing. Uh, I could represent those clusters, in this case, as tumor infiltrating lymphocyte maps, and I might want to be compare different till maps. So what is a feature? What is the label that I really need to keep in my data set? Well, the answer is all of the above. We've been working with our colleagues at Stony Brook, Joel Saltz and his team, on the pathology version of this, hence the, the pathology start. Uh, all these tools are part of the Cancer Imaging Archive, but we're focusing now on this one, which is a feature base. And we're trying to develop the standards for how do I represent image features, because they don't exist. There isn't a DICOM standard for image feature sets. How do I represent a feature vector? And what we've determined thus far is, in fact, the basic, most basic format in, in which to store this information is a fourth order tensor. Great compact mathematical representation, really hard to structure for a database to manage. So we're, we're struggling with how to organize this information and how to manage all those classes of features, provide some kind of semantic integration. For engineered features, there are ontologies which are growing and are, are very good, but for learned features or for annotations, there really aren't. So, and then how to link these features to the data that they came from because we combine information from multiple trials. So the images, a given feature set may have come from images from different places and we need to maintain all those linkages. So just to, my summary is actually very similar to what other people have said, which is we really have to have high quality data. I think I've given you my definition of high quality data, which is a little bit different. Um, we have to have huge quantities of data that is labeled. I don't think that human labels are going to do that. And as I, I should have mentioned in, in the point I made about um, the Staple and Veritas algorithms, human label data for machine learning is a trap because if the algorithm does better than the human expert, you will always be penalized because the ex human expert was the definition of truth. So we need models of truth that don't penalize the algorithm so that they can actually uh, produce better results, we hope. And to me, the answer is open access repositories that allow us to all share this information. And as I've shown you, we've been pretty successful at building such repositories and having people share them. Thank you. Oh, sorry. The next presentation is on the role of open source and open collaboration for imaging AI. And it will be delivered by Dr. Kibun from Arlington. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oftentimes when uh, uh, one uh, uh, gives a, a presentation, uh, sometimes one ends the presentation with the announcement that we're having such a conference, please come. I'm doing it backward. Uh, <laughs> last week, I uh, worked with uh, Fred Fryer to organize a small uh, workshop with 50 people on a very similar topic. I started the uh, workshop with these two cartoons. Is AI going uh, <laughs> to make us better or worse? But the most interesting thing was uh, the one about the uh, class on machine learning. One thought, wow, machine learning is really exciting and interesting. If I do that, I don't have to deal with data normalization. Well, you cannot escape that. <laughs> and uh, we are learning that over and over uh, here in uh, Lisbon. First, I was uh, puzzled by the title of your uh, conference. It's not a word that we use that much, at least in my circle in the United States, so I looked it up. It has uh, different uh, meanings. So I'm trying to focus on the second part of the meaning, trying to understand what this widget is all about. There was a uh, workshop uh, hosted by uh, NIH uh, last year and published uh, a paper. 
And in that paper, def uh, defines machine learning system must be capable of explaining or uh, illustrating the advice they provide to human users. So this issue of explainability becomes an important part of the uh, discussion. But in that, we also find, we hear about black box, black box all the time. Then recently, there was a report published by a group of radiologists, and uh, the document looks like a number of uh, attorneys participated, uh, talking about ethics of AI in radiology. I'm not an ethicist, but this is your AI. Something goes in, something comes out. Uh, and uh, in recent uh, years, there has been explosive growth in publication of use AI outside of imaging, uh, medical imaging community. In those uh, cases, uh, you see that uh, they do a reasonably decent job of producing something, but not that relevant for uh, medical application. So the, for those of us who are working in software, sometimes we talk about uh, open architecture, okay? That is, uh, we need to see what's inside. And when you go to AI meetings, you see this type of diagrams all the time. So in a way, this describes different parameters and processes in, in the uh, AI uh, uh, process that you can control. But oftentimes, we don't really know what really those things really do. Now, you radiologists will not need to know beyond this, perhaps, but your research partner who, uh, you know, on the uh, technical side will need to know more than this. So this is where the open source software comes. The software completely open will give you a maximum transparency. And also what you will learn that some of these open source code that you can download from multiple sites are not necessarily optimized for diagnostic imaging purpose. So why am I talking about open source in uh, machine learning or AI conference? There are increasing number of uh, open source machine learning packages all around us, perhaps even 100 or more. And many papers, especially outside of uh, medical community, uh, have been published using this black box and say declare victory. Now I'm sure uh, some of you here will use some of these open source packages in your research. And also, I'm sure the, uh, our industry partners are looking at a lot of these open source packages as well. So what do we really need to know about the best practice in open source? And how do we take advantage of the open source software community uh, to advance uh, your uh, research or development agenda? Open source concept got actually started quite some years ago in, in the early 80s. And in some ways, open source is very misunderstood because open source is readily available free of charge. So it's a free software, free software. Yes, software may be free, but understanding the software is not free. The free has more to do with the freedom of what you want to do with the code. In a way, it's a social movement and philosophy for developing software code in a shared environment. Now, this sort of open source concept got codified a bit further because some years ago, the American government said to AT&T phone companies, you know, you're in a phone business, so you should not be developing software. So in order to force the AT&T just to do phone business, they forced the AT&T to release a number of their intellectual properties to the community. So one of the things that was uh, uh, released at that time was earlier version of Unix operating system. Under the sp uh, stipulation that the software can be licensed without royalty payment, that is no fees, under no obligation for technical support. So AT&T does not have to be responsible for the software, but you cannot charge any money. Therefore, it became the beginning of concept of free software. But understand that free software has 
no particular obligations to the end user. Then, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the software package that came out of AT&T went through a number of iterations in the community. So Linus uh, you know, wrote additional packages to make the uh, Unix operating system that much easier to use. So eventually that became one of the most popular operating systems in the world. And then it also uh, Linus is the guy who developed the very first version of Git that has become GitHub and now it's owned by uh, Microsoft. Many different companies have open source business, open source uh, policies, or some organizations, their entire business is open source. Uh, you have known uh, you know, Linux Foundation, and there's an organization called OpenStack. This is a software package that came out of NASA to the public and became the core technology for uh, uh, the most of the uh, work you do in your cloud environment. So you see a number of different open source activities like that, but they all have, they all use different open source licenses uh, that supports their business model. Yes, it's free. Yes, it's readily available, but there are certain conditions, and this, those conditions are the ones that you should be familiar with. Now, when I started this Open Source Foundation about seven years ago uh, uh, with the sponsorship of the United States government, I would go to give a talk about open source. And most the uh, companies, at least in health IT, you are a very dangerous guy. Open source software is dangerous, unreliable, and shouldn't be used in healthcare. But that's not the first time I was told being a uh, uh, <laughs> dangerous guy. Late 80s, I was very much involved in promoting PACs with the huge funding from Department of Defense. Again, I was told I was a dangerous guy promoting uh, digital imaging. Number one, image quality will never be good enough. Guess who, who said that? Kodak Corporation. Have you ever heard Kodak Corporation? <laughs> then I go to uh, radiology community. You're a very dangerous guy. You're going to make radiology service a commodity service. Well, today, I, yes, earlier I heard that uh, somebody reported PAX really has improved the efficiency of radiology service by 30%. That really makes me feel good. So I was not that dangerous. <laughs> so a little bit about open source in terms of uh, more legalistic terms. Open source software has to be licensed under proper uh, license. The creator of the code has the copyright and the copyright holder issues a license so that the end user can study the code, change the code, and distribute the code following the rules of the license. The two things are important here. Without proper license, it's not considered as a, uh, open source, okay? And also copyright holder, that could be the individual or the organization, provides rights to license. So if you look at the code, open source code, there has to be a sort of header information like thing in the beginning, what this license is all about. There are many different licenses, uh, maybe 50 or more, and these licenses are not equal. Sometimes they're not even compatible. For instance, if you're in this uh, space, if you see the license uh, with the GPL license, and if you make mix this code with the license from this code, they get all mixed up, we call it uh, extremely viral. The license on this side is very restrictive, license on that side, it's very flexible. So at uh, OSERA, my organization, we support Apache 2 license for all the things we do. This is not to say you shouldn't use this, this is not to say you shouldn't use that either. There are rules how you should mix and match. And also you can relicense it. You can get a license, Apache 2 license, for whatever reason you'd like to make it more restrictive, you can relicense it under this. But if you start from here, you cannot go back there. Now, uh, in the past, uh, this GPL license was much, uh, much more popular, but over the years, uh, you see 
that uh, more use of the Apache II license, more flexible uh, license. Whenever we think of uh, open source, and somebody briefly also mentioned the open data, we think of the computer software itself. Yes, that is true, but there is a large amount of activity that goes behind. So the ecosystem of open source includes certainly the software, rules of engagement, business rules that has to do with the uh, license, and the community. In fact, the community may be the most important part of this open source uh, phenomena, so to speak, because that's the community you interact, and that's the community you collaborate, and that's the community that can help you if you're willing to contribute. And open source code can be commercialized. As I mentioned earlier, code itself doesn't have any warranty. Sometimes it doesn't even have a user manual. But if you want to productize it, make a commercial product, you can do so by adding additional services and capabilities. Back to machine learning. These are some of the you know, popular convolution neural network packages you can find on the internet. And the number is growing. So if you look at some of these uh, packages, there's a list of creators. The first one is out of Berkeley, and so on and so forth. And some you can see are supported by very large corporation uh, like Google. Then it has certain licenses. You can see the BSC license, MIT license, and so on and so forth. Then the platform. And also it uh, shows when it was released, uh, and also it shows what language that was written in. So your uh, technical partner might have a preference over one language over the other and one platform over the other. So that will be one of those factors you need to consider uh, making decisions. And here you can see a very high level uh, summary of uh, different uh, attributes of different licenses. And also there are some additional details uh, that you can look up. And uh, in this case, for instance, uh, TensorFlow is one of the more popular, more sophisticated. Uh, however, uh, if you go to Keras, or uh, that is less uh, uh, flexible but it's easier to use. So if you want to start something fairly quick, perhaps you might want to look at uh, Caress or uh, uh, Cafe 2. For instance, uh, TensorFlow, this is one example of the kind of parameters you can control to run the network. Uh, but in case of a Caress, there are less number of parameters. So for the quick training, uh, to get a, a quick orientation of what this is all about, that may be a, a better option. So before you start the AI project, as someone mentioned earlier today, there are two types of AIs. That is a machine uh, uh, learning that uh, uh, depends on the supervised learning and unsupervised learning. A lot of the work we do in radiology has to do with the supervised learning, with the classification, or at times regression. So if you want to pick a package of software, software language, operating environment, and see whether they have a reasonable amount of documentation. Some of the most interesting packages came, came out recently don't have much documentation. <laughs> so that would be difficult to use, but sometimes it, gives some, it has some very interesting ideas. And try to create, a, at least find out a community. I don't think there is a uh, AI open source software community for radiology. And I think time has come to consider such thing because these open source packages are not properly optimized. This community uh, is very important. In some cases, community can be 10 or could be 20 or can be you know, 100. But these are the, you know, this community oftentimes consists of people with the complementary expertise. At Ocera, I, we organize different committees. One committee, one community, you know what? This community came and said, you know, we want to collaborate and we want your help. Well, okay. I said, uh, what would you like to do? And uh, they uh, looked at us, no, what, 
does what Sarah wanted us to do. I said, no, you are the expert. Like a community manager like oh, Sarah, we're the facilitator. So you decide what it is that you would like to do, decide the priority, then we will facilitate meetings, we will facilitate the software development process. They looked at each other for a year. <laughs> Finally, they realized it's their business that we are going to support. So once the collaboration took place, they realized they have complementary expertise and so on and so forth, then the productivity took off. Okay. So, well, okay, so you pick a software package you want to play with. Uh, then some of the things you should consider is, is this package really optimal for diagnostic imaging? The package is stable, or how efficient is that? Because some of the packages require tremendous computing horsepower. You may not want to do that. Okay, then when you look at, let's say, convolutional neural network, you know, how many layers can it support, and how to label images, all those things that we've been talking about today. Well, most of the uh, open source code that's available are very good at identifying uh, lions and dogs, but that's not really that good for grayscale images. So this is where additional innovations will be added into existing framework. And also in commercial business, it's important to know whether that's P or Q or B or D. In medical imaging, orientation doesn't really matter, I don't think, okay? So perhaps the kind of uh, capabilities they're trying to optimize to handle characters may not be the ones that uh, you need to pay attention to. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> so when you try to uh, optimize uh, your project, you have to pay attention to two things. We heard a lot about the data for training, data for testing, and you really have to marry the data sets you have with the capabilities that you will eventually uh, develop on the convolution neural network. So you have to look at deficiencies and so on and so forth. Uh, Oftentimes people ask, how many images do you need? Okay, so everybody has their opinions. So here I'd like to just tell you one specific example of the project we did. We did the, uh, uh, using the uh, lung cancer screening data, we developed a, a, a product uh, for our partner. In that we used about 1,000 uh, CT cases for training and 300 uh, CT cases uh, for testing. And uh, we had to add additional cases uh, to the mix so that it can have a reasonable uh, spectrum of uh, uh, cases. Uh, when then software was tested in another country, <laughs> well, this country had other type of lung diseases that we are not aware of. So the software did not really do well in that country, but it's doing well in the United States. So these are some visual examples of what happens once you pe feed something into this black box. The number of steps it goes through, each step has certain parameters you can control. Again, in some cases, those parameters have more to do with the computational efficiency than the uh, computational accuracy. Okay. Earlier today, uh, uh, we talked about uh, difficulties in reproducing uh, certain uh, research results. This was the paper published in 2017, not about convolution neural network or machine learning. It's about uh, fMRI. Uh, reviewers looked at, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the author looked at about 24,000 fMRI results. And that time they claimed uh, more than 80% could not be reproduced. So that created a huge scandal. Then later it was corrected and saying that uh, perhaps about 3,500 uh, papers, uh, the results of the papers could not be reproduced. So the second paper concludes uh, their argument by saying the ease of analysis afforded by some of the software programs belies the complexity of the methods the ease of use does not release experimentalists from their responsibility 
of uh, valid finding. I think this uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, I call it almost intelligence, has a tremendous potential, more than any other technologies that came into radiology. It's, you know, from digital imaging and all these other things that, that uh, we've done. But this is gonna be different. Uh, at the end of the day, if it's gonna be used largely to improve the efficiency of entire operation, including perhaps outside of radiology domain, it's going to take a bit longer time, but I think the radiology community, I think, is better prepared uh, to deal with this because you've been at it longer than anybody else. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.